Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is the third recording for chapter 29 on heredity. There we go. All right, um, we were learning about one type of inheritance called dominant recessive inheritance, and that is where you get two alleles, one from each parent, and um, you can, um, there for, for that particular trait, there is a dominant version of the trait and a recessive version of the trait. So if you end up heterozygous, um, then you're going to express the dominant version of the trait. So what are some dominant traits in humans? Um, these are kind of strange, like they're gonna sound kind of strange to you because we really don't have a lot, a whole, whole lot of traits that are inherited this way. But one is widow's peak. It's dominant to have a little point or peak at, on your, um, at your hairline, on your, like in your forehead area. Um, and some people get their hair cut in such a way as to hide that peak. But I mean, most people have one, uh, even if it's a small one, most people have a widow's peak. It's a dominant trait. Um, freckles are a dominant trait. Dimples are a dominant trait. Double jointed thumbs, the ability to roll the sides of your tongue up. That's what is meant by roll your tongue. Um, you can either do that or you can't. So you can try that right now if you want to, if you haven't already. Um, and you're either are able to do it or you can't. You can't train yourself to do it. It's a gene that allows you to roll the sides of your tongue up or not. And then there is a chemical that you can either taste or not taste. It's called phenylthiocarbamide. Um, and then there is a dominant disorder. Um, this is a dominant lethal disorder called Huntington's disease. You may, may or may not have heard of that, but you wouldn't think that a dominant disorder would really be able to, um, that you would see it a lot because well, you, I'm sorry, I said that completely backwards. <laughs> you would think you would see it a lot, right? So Huntington's disease, you don't see a lot of individuals who have it. And um, you, you may not always even know when somebody has it, but it, it is lethal and it basically causes them to lose control of their muscles gradually until finally, you know, they don't even, they can't even control the muscles that allow them to breathe. So they die. You know, it's, it's really a horrible disease. It's a horrible genetic, um, you know, inherited disease. Um, and Huntington's disease is, you know, you would think if somebody had that disease, they just wouldn't have children, you know. But it is a, it's, it's caused by a delayed action gene. The, act, the gene that, caught, that is responsible for Huntington's is not activated until a person is about age 40. And because of that, they've already, you know, many, many times they've already had children. This is after childbearing age. So um, that is the reason why we still see it. And, and you know, um, we still see people who have it. So the offspring of an individual with Huntington's will have a 50% chance of having Huntington's. I mean, no matter what. Any offspring, any child of an individual with Huntington's will have a 50% chance of having it, okay? Now, for recessive conditions, um, normal endochondral ossification is a recessive trait, believe it or not, whereas achondroplasia is a dominant trait. So how can that be? Well, um, it you just don't, I guess, uh, People who have achondroplasia don't have children as much, so you don't see that dominant trait as often. But the normal ossification of our bones as we grow, it, in other words, that process where our um, arm bones and leg bones are um, grow longer and wider as we get older, and, and uh, eventually there's a, um, gosh, I can't even think today. The um, cartilage growth plate. What is the, the anatomy name for that? The growth plate. Um, but anyway, it closes up. You remember learning about this and the um, 
in uh, bio 168, but it closes up when an individual is fully grown, but it um, continues to be there and um, it's, it's made of cartilage, so it continues to be there. Epiphyseal, there we go, epiphyseal plate. The epiphyseal plate is made of cartilage and it's, at the, it's found between the shaft and the epiphysis of long bones. And then it becomes a line that you can see in the fully mature um, adult bone once that person has stopped growing. So that normal, that process of endochondral ossification is recessive, okay? There are also some genetic disorders that are recessive. Um, albinism, cystic fibrosis, and Tay-Sachs are recessive disorders. And you can look that up. If a person is heterozygous for a recessive disorder, we say they are carriers of that trait. That means they can pass it on to their offspring that they don't have it. This is a table of um, different traits that are um, inherited by dominant recessive inheritance. Okay, so we have webbed digits is dominant. Normal digits is recessive. Ha. Huh. So webbed digits or syndactyly is actually a dominant. And I would just encourage you, if you're curious about this, <laughs> is just to Google it um, because I do need to move on to different inheritance patterns uh, besides dominant recessive. But that's interesting, right? So achondroplasia, um, when a person is heterozygous, then they have dwarfism. When they're homozygous, it's lethal. That is a dominant disorder. Huntington disease is dominant. Normal skin pigment is dominant, whereas albinism is recessive. Tay-Sachs is recessive and cystic fibrosis is recessive. Now let's talk about a different type of inheritance called incomplete dominance. This is the same as dominant recessive inheritance, except for in the heterozygous individual. In the heterozygous individual, you have a blending kind of or it's like they will have the trait that's kind of intermediate between um, the, the other two forms. So there's really going to be three phenotypes. There'll be a different phenotype for the heterozygous individual than there will for the homozygous dominant. So the sickling gene exhibits incomplete dominance. Um, you've probably heard of sickle cell anemia. So if you have two big S's, your homozygous dominant, then you have normal hemoglobin, your red blood cells are round and nice and round, and you don't have any sickling of your red blood cells, which causes uh, a lot of problems, pain and blood clots and things like that. If you inherit big S and little s, then you're heterozygous, and what, you, you, what they say is that you have sickle cell trait. So you're going to have some intermediate types of problems. You, um, you're you going to have some normal red blood cells, and some are going to be have the mutated hemoglobin and be sickle-shaped. Um, so a person can su suffer a sickle cell crisis if they have gone without oxygen for a long time, but they're going to be a lot healthier, a lot, you know, a lot better off than a person who is homozygous, recessive, little s, little s, that person will have sickle cell anemia and all of their um, red blood cells are susceptible to being sickle shaped. And, um, you know, when uh, they can have many sickle cell crises during their lifetime. Um, multiple allele inheritance is when, now so far we've talked about traits that only have two alleles or two versions, two different versions of that trait, but multiple alleles will have more than two. And the best example, the most common example, particularly with humans, is the ABO blood groups, okay? So multiple alleles means that there are more than two alleles. This does not mean a person inherits more than two alleles. A person can only inherit two alleles for any trait because they only have two parents. So you're always just going to inherit one allele for a trait from your mom and one allele for a trait from your dad. 
But in the case of blood groups, there are three versions. And they are big IA, big IB, and little i. <clears throat> so you can get two big IAs, or you can get big IA and a little i. You know, you can get a mixture of these alleles, or you can get two of the same allele, but you're still just going to inherit two of these three. But because there are three versions, three alleles for that trait, it's called multiple alleles. So um, let's see, there's another inheritance pattern here that shows up in blood types. And that is if you inherit a big IA and a big IB, that's codominant. That means you're going to be blood type AB because both of those alleles are expressed. It's not a blending. You literally are going to have some a antigens and some B antigens on your red blood cells. So they're, they're, they're both, they're co-dominant, okay, to each other. And the recessive form is little i. And if you get two little i's, you're going to have type O. But if you have, like, for example, let's say your IA and little i, you inherit I, big IA from your dad and little i, I from your mom, then you're going to have uh, type A blood. So a person who has type A blood can have two IA alleles or they can be IA little i. And it's the same way with type B. You can have two IB alleles or you can be IB little i and that'll give you type B blood. Then the only way to get type O blood is two little i's. Okay, so two little i's gives you type O blood. All right, so blood groups, and uh, this is so much better than me saying, me verbally telling you. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't, I didn't realize this was next. Okay, so if you're type O, your genotype is little i, little i. If you're type A, you can have either of these two genotypes. If you're type B, you can have either of these two. And if you're at type AB, you're going to have I, A, I, B. Um, and we're not going over whether you're positive or negative, but that's also inherited. Um, that's a, a whole, that's kind of separate, but um, we're going to move on to sex-linked inheritance. This is when the chromosome that contains the gene for this trait is the X sex chromosome. So the gene is not found on the Y. So it's sex-linked or sometimes we call it X-linked because the Y sex chromosome does not have that gene. These are genes that are only found on the X sex chromosome. So <clears throat> if you're a male and you only have one X sex chromosome, you always express an X-linked recessive allele. If you're female, you still have to have two recessive alleles to express it. So X-linked recessive alleles are always expressed in males. They're not masked because they don't have a counterpart or an allele um, counterpart on the Y, okay? But females still have to have two recessive alleles to express the recessive condition. So what are some um, X-linked or sex-linked conditions? Hemophilia, red-green color blindness, um, certain types of muscular dystrophy. And you mostly are gonna see these in um, male children and, and males in general. So what we're looking at here is an example of <clears throat> red-green color blindness. And in this case, the father has normal color vision. So he has X big N, which is the allele for normal vision, and then a Y. And you can see that represented in the Punnett square, X big N and Y. And then the woman, the, the mother, is a carrier. So she's heterozygous for colorblindness. That means she's not colorblind, but she can pass it on. So she's got one allele that's X big N, and her other X sex chromosome has a little n allele. So when you put them together, there is a 25% chance they'll have a child that is a female um, homozygous dominant for normal color vision. That's what the N stands for. There is a 25% chance they'll have a son who has normal color vision. There is a 25% chance they will have a daughter who is a carrier 
for red-green colorblindness. And then there is a 25% chance they'll have a son who has colorblindness, red-green colorblindness. Okay, so that's sex-linked inheritance. And then there's polygenic inheritance, which means that there are many genes that um, add or sum their effects together to give you that trait. So if you think about skin color, height, intelligence, metabolic rate, these are these don't have two versions. <laughs> we don't just have dark and light. You know, we have many, many versions of skin color, many, many versions of height, many, many versions of intelligence. We say they there is a continuous variation between the two extremes of the trait. So there's a continuous variation between the darkest of skin color and the lightest of skin color. So that means there must be several gene pairs that add their, their effects together. That's polygenic inheritance. So um, what they're showing you here is a person who has um, gene A, B, and C, and they get two big A's, two big B's, two big C's. Or that would be the person who has like the darkest skin pigment. And then a person who gets two little A's, two little B's, two little C's would have the lightest pigment. So there's actually three different genes in this example that control on skin pigment. And <clears throat> so it would be the combination of big letters and little letters. How you, the more big letters you have, the darker your skin would be. So, um, and, so and this just shows you the some of the different shades of skin and different um, pigments, but not all of them, of course. But anyway, skin color, um, height, intelligence, and a lot of other different things are controlled by more than one gene. And then there's a section on environmental factors that affect gene expression. I always give this example, um, and then I'm going to have to, um, we're going to have to stop because we're at the end of the, uh, I try not to go too much over 15 minutes. But anyway, um, environmental factors. For example, I used to tell my students um, before COVID, I had been coloring my hair for years. So I would ask them if this was my natural hair color and I have brown hair and um but it's brown with the mix of gray <laughs> but um before I let the gray grow out you know and I let the color grow out um it was just all you know one color but it was not it was from the environment you know it was from I had it done at a salon um now I do have brown hair naturally I mean, that is that is the hair color that I had most of my life, except when I was a small child and it was blonde. But um, genetically, I have brown hair. And if I wanted to color it a different color than brown, you know, if I wanted red hair, then that would be due to environmental factors. Um, a person who has, a, you know, who's not really dark, um, well, everybody can get a suntan. I mean, everybody can get darker in the sun, no matter what your skin shade. But, you know, especially a person who um, in the winter months, you'll see them and they'll have really light skin. I'm an example of this, too, because I do tend to um, uh, be out in the sun in the summer. And I do tend to be a lot darker in complexion in the summer and always have, you know, since I was little. But um, that's environmental factors. I'm naturally a light skin, you know, pretty light, fairly light skin person. Um, and sometimes I'll put on that um, that fake tan spray st or, or that you um, apply, you know, <laughs> um, with a little glove. Uh, and, and, you know, those are all examples of environmental um, effects on our genetics.